Okay. Good day, uh, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to this very important discussion uh, on agriculture uh, as part of Ukraine, uh, Washington and Ukraine and beyond. I will introduce Morgan, uh, though you, I sort of feel like he doesn't need any introduction because he's everybody knows him in Ukraine and other places. But just as a reminder, he was elected chairman of the USUBC Executive Council in 2005 and as president in 2007. Uh, remembering 2005, I am uh, happy to recall that we were uh, housing the US-Ukraine Business Council when it was reconstituting itself. And so great success to Morgan. Uh, Morgan has had a distinguished career. I'm not going to go through uh, all of it, but he is also currently serving as the gov uh, Director of uh, Government Affairs for uh, Washington for uh, Sigma Blazer. Uh, he's worked in the field of international e economic development for almost 30 years. Morgan, we're all showing our ages, aren't we? He was born in Kansas and uh, got his uh, MA degree from the University of Kansas. Uh, he started his work in Ukraine in 1992 as a senior advisor to a major food system, a development project in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, well, uh, Morgan is also a founder and publisher of the Action Ukraine Report, uh, an electronic news information service that has been distributed worldwide for the past uh, six years. Very, very important. Uh, Morgan, I have to, looking at the title of this panel, I have to recall when uh, we put together a conference on the Hill. I, uh, I think it was the late 90s or early uh, 2001. And the title of that uh, conference was From the Bread Basket to the Market Basket. Mm -hmm. So we see that we have progressed beyond that. Um, and so that's, uh, we're very excited to hear about uh, all of the successes and the growth in this sector. Just another comment for that. Uh, we had this conference on the Hill and we were determined to showcase uh, products coming from Ukraine. And that was a challenge. We had to travel to New York to uh, get things and uh, other places and get things from Canada. And we served uh, members of Congress a lunch uh, featuring Ukrainian products. And of course, uh, Veranike that the embassy of Ukraine provided. So Morgan, a lot, you've been doing a lot and you have accomplished enough. So I turn over the, the uh, Mike, to you. Thank you, Morgan. Thank oh, you very much, Nadia. Go ahead. One more thing. I We could not put together these kind of events uh, without partnerships. And one of our great partners uh, has been uh, Morgan Williams with the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council, as I say, going back many years. So I thank him for his uh, putting together this event. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. I know there's one person that's known here and in Ukraine about supporting Ukraine more than myself, and that's got to be you. Uh, <laughs> you've been doing this forever. Uh, thank you very much for your support, for your kind words, and thank you very much for the U.S.-Ukraine uh, Foundation putting together this very important series of events. Uh, we're very pleased in fact, the U.S.-Ukraine Business Council to be uh, invited to be a part of this. Our One of our major focuses has been agribusiness. Yes, it's been... Uh, Ukraine's food system, moving food from pr producer to consumer, from the field to the table, making Ukraine not just an exporter of raw products, but high value products. So we're very pleased to have a very high level, very distinguished panel with us today. So on behalf of the U.S. Ukraine Business Council, thank you for everyone for participating. We have Sergei Zapochuk from uh, Pravio Group of Companies. We have Oleg Samos from Sayenko Krajenko. We have a longtime friend, Andre Rosinski from Bungie. And we have a person I met almost 30 years ago, Leonid Kozachenko, former deputy minister of agriculture and the head of the Ukrainian Agrarian Confederation. And a young guy, uh, Mikhailo Rizek from Nebulon. So we'll move right ahead. We're gonna be talking about uh, Ukraine's food system. It's very important. It's critical to Ukraine. It's critical to feeding the world. It's made great progress, uh, but we can have a lot further to go. We can produce a lot more food and a lot more high value food. 
So today we're focusing on mainly infrastructure, moving the food. How do we get it out of the field? How do we get it to the elevator, to the processing plant? How do we get it to the canning plant? How do we get it to the port for exports? How do we do this better, more effectively and more efficiently? There's no better better person to talk to about this than Leonard Kozacheko. Leonard, I'm gonna ask you for some few uh, brief comments about Ukraine's food system and moving Ukraine's food system forward. Thank you, Leonard. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Morgan. It's a very big honor for me to attend this conference today. To you, it's really almost 30 years you sp spent to support Ukraine, and you began your uh, uh, job here in Ukraine just for the purpose of developing agriculture of Ukraine. So I know everything, each step you made here. So I'm very th thankful to you, first of all. Uh, and thank you for this conference. Uh, why? Because now the problem connecting with foodstuff is very uh, important for the globe, not just for Ukraine. You know that every day almost 30,000 people dying because of hunger. Every year, the number of people in, uh, the, who is not able to live without food. That's why countries like Ukraine, where we have a huge potential to be developed, must this uh, and uh, uh, just Ukraine itself would be not able to uh, develop its potential. Uh, we need people like uh, different countries to be uh, partners in on the way to develop the potential of agriculture of Ukraine. Uh, I have, fortunately, it's not possible to present some documents, but I, uh, I got from GAFTA uh, 20 years ago when I visited uh, the office of GAFTA. It, it, it was located in England, in London. Uh, I found the document not one, several documents uh, from beginning of 19 and the end of 18th century. There were very funny documents uh, providing information about uh, be delivered to the uh, world market. And Ukraine was providing more than 50% of that product. So uh, Ukraine, uh, what's called as grain box basket more than 200 years ago. And now, of course, we have to revive the status and we have to do a lot because uh, we have industrial farming, we have high quality land, uh, we have low cost of labor, we have very good market infrastructure, but it must be developed, of course, for uh, uh, utilizing existing potential, we need just 75 approximately billion US dollars. It's not a big amount because annually at the globe, almost 150 billion being invested. So we need half of that amount, which every year is as FDI, foreign direct invested, uh, provided for agriculture development. So we need in 10 years, 15 maximum, attract $75 billion to uh, the full potential of agriculture of Ukraine. What can we obtain for that? We can uh, increase uh, production of grain, a uh, minimum 120 million tons. Today, it's about 60 million. So it would be double. The uh, production of food stock in total um, should be tripled. Um, so it would be about 100 billion. Today it's about 35 billion. Uh, it is absolutely realistic, uh, let's say, uh, way to go. What we need, just we need uh, potential investors, uh, which, uh, which uh, are available, first of all, in the United States, in different European countries. Uh, now, you, EU, European Union, a little bit concerned about that, that Ukraine is taking second position as the biggest supplier of grain, number one position as supplier of sun oil, 
etc., etc. So sometimes uh, they are getting nervous. Look, U.S. is number one. Ukraine is number two. <laughs> U.S. is number three. U.S. is 27 countries, but Ukraine is one country, and we are exporting more grain than uh, European Union. So instead of this, we need investors from the European Union. On the contrary, and what uh, bad thing, but more and more investors coming from China and the Middle East, not from United States, unfortunately, not from European Union, unfortunately. That's why we have to think how we can join uh, uh, around this project and we can move uh, forward together. I, I, I said that I am not against who is coming, but I personally prefer those who I mentioned. Why I could explain later. So this is my uh, short introduction. And of course, if you put questions, I would be very happy to answer the question. We can talk about particular ways of uh, moving in the production of crop, in production of livestock, in the food processing, in infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So, but this is general, uh, let's say, uh, approach to the situation we have in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leonard. Uh, let's turn on now to a person that uh, we've known for a long time. Uh, when I needed to know something what was going on in agriculture in Ukraine, I would get a hold of Oleg Samos. Oleg always knew what was going on. He had his fingers on the pulse. We made him a senior advisor to USUBC for agribusiness. So Oleg, uh, you're now a partner in a law firm, but uh, you're still very involved in agribusiness. You wrote me and said you can tell us where we are now. Uh, where are what are the key facts? Where is Ukraine now in terms of its food system, and uh, from which we need to improve and move forward? Oleg, it's all yours. Thank you, Morgan, for the kind words, like distinguished audience, distinguished panelists, and organizers. Uh, Ukraine is still one of the leading uh, country in producing grains today. Uh, I remember the times maybe 10 years ago when we were talking about 50 million tons of grains of harvest, like, and we basically expected this amount. Now we overcome it. And now we are talking about 120 million tons. And of course, when we grow the production, we need also to grow the infrastructure. And in Ukraine, there are also challenges in the infrastructure. We'll talk a little bit later, but these challenges are also opportunities for the investors in order to put their money with the good returns. Uh, if we talk about the Ukrainian export of agricultural products, uh, it is 49% of total Ukrainian export for 2020. So it's quite a big amount uh, of Ukrainian exports. And of course, the key products are grains. The key product is sunflower oil. Like we are now see the leading like honey, berries, like vegetable milks. And of course, about the destinations. Our traditional destination were Russia, but after the war in, uh, in Eastern part of Ukraine, uh, we had to uh, mitigate our uh, export markets. And basically we started more to export to EU. And we see now that the share of agricultural product to EU like is about 38%. And export to China increased mostly twice for the last year. And Ukraine is very rapidly moving to sign in the free trade agreement. We signed in 2017 the DCFTA with EU, which opens the European market. But also we signed in, 2007, in 2020 with Israel, with UK, we are trying to open another markets for the Ukrainian products. But what are the main challenges? Uh, it's of course the logistics, because currently we are having 40% higher logistic costs than in Europe. And as Leonid says, uh, we need a heavy investment into the agriculture and into the infrastructure 
like around 75 uh, billions, like what uh, I confirm what Remit Leonid is saying, that needed to make the modernization of the agriculture, including the transportation. And uh, we can talk about roads, we can talk about rail, we can talk about river and seaports uh, going forward during this, uh, uh, during this meeting. And basically, I can also discuss what should be done in each of the category in order to move the grain faster, and not only the grain, but other food products. Only real quickly, you, you uh, wrote me and said something about what, uh, how, much, how many of the roads are in bad condition? What percent of the river potential we're using? Uh, what, uh, give, us a, give us a little idea of what the unused potential out there is for roads and rivers. And, and ports. Yeah, basically, in Ukraine, there were not significant investment into the roads, and 95% of the roads are in not in a very good conditions. And 90% of the roads they were not repaired for the last 30 years. But roads, it's one side. They're not good for transporting the big lots of grain and uh, of the bulk cargo. Like we see the biggest potential is a uh, rail and also the river because the river is currently used only for 3%. While even in Soviet time, it was used uh, heavily in order to transfer uh, the products like from the central Ukraine into the ports. And uh, of course, when we talk about the rail, the rail uh, condition is not very good also. 98% of the locomotives are already tiered and they are aged 30, 40 years. And of course they need to be replaced. But the strategy for Ukraine should be definitely moving from the transportation by the trucks into the transportation of the uh, rail and uh, by river. Well, thank you very much. We all know for many years, uh, every, everybody in agribusiness says the biggest problem we have is the UC, the Ukraine railroad system. And uh, it's still a big problem. We'll talk about that later. Probably probably 25 years ago, I ran into Andre Rosicki. Andre was working in Kiev for a major grain company. Now he's moved on to, to a big regional position. And now he's with Bungie. And of course, Bunky does about everything you can in the food system besides sourcing, processing, bottling, uh, selling uh, branded consumer products. Andre, you talked to us a little about the, the major impact of Bunky and particularly about your, uh, uh, you know, moving into high quality food products and branding it and exporting high quality oils uh, uh, to the world. And I think maybe also to the United States. Andre, thank you very much. It's all yours. Uh, thank you, Morgan. It's a pleasure, actually, to be here with you, and uh, thanks for this invitation. I'd like to repeat what Nadia said earlier. You know, Morgan has been with Ukraine for years and has been one of the biggest advocates of Ukraine in the U.S., and I think we all thank you for that. Um, and for me, personally, it's been great to work with you, as you said, in a few different roles, recently uh, with Bangi and... Uh, and I'd like to say a few words about what we do and uh, what the opportunity, opportunities are. I'm probably the first speaker who is actually representing an investor in Ukraine. So for, for the audience, I'd like to, 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 to remind, Bangi is the US listed company, um, the biggest oasis crusher in the world. Uh, we've been in Ukraine since for 20 years, almost 20, uh, since 20, 2002. Since then, we have invested uh, $300 million in assets and uh, more than that much into working capital. Um, we are uh, an owner of a big uh, industrial complex, a port terminal and, oil seeds, and the biggest European oil seeds crush, sunflower crushing plant in Nikolaev. We also own the plant in Dnipropetrovsk that, as Morgan rightly mentioned, produces food products. We own the uh, number one uh, vegetable oil brand in Ukraine called Oleina. And uh, recently we have also moved to, to another value added product. We have opened a, a plant uh, together with our uh, partner, Daxa. It's a dry corn milling plant producing grits 
for the uh, from corn in Ukraine. So uh, we're moving higher in the value chain. Let's put it this way. Uh, so uh, a few words about the market and the Ukraine. I mean, as Morgan said, I'm becoming slowly a veteran of the industry. So I can tell you as a good example of uh, of the turnaround that Ukraine went over these 30 years of independence. My first job, uh, and I in another company, but in the same industry, uh, was around 30 years ago. And one of the first big tenders I participated with was selling 300,000 tons of corn to Ukraine. Because Ukraine was a corn deficit country at that time. After, um, you know, the... Um, uh, 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 years of communism, this breadbasket of Europe and world has become a deficit country. Today, Ukraine is becoming one of the key exporters of uh, corn in the world. And uh, I think it's important because we are, after, I don't know, 10 years of relatively stable prices, we are, seems that we are going back to the super cycle, super cycle in the agriculture. We are seeing the prices going up. We are seeing the demand uh, for all the product that Ukraine is producing increasing. So it's a wonderful time to Ukraine. And I think it's a wonderful time. I will repeat what Leonid Kozachenko said for the US investors to come here and help Ukraine to, 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 um, to build on, on this environment. Just to, just to say a few words, the corn prices have reached uh, $7 a bushel price. This is the price we have not seen for 10 years in the world. We have sunflower oil prices, and I will repeat what Oleg and Leonid said, Ukraine is the biggest producer of sunflower seed and biggest exporter of sunflower oil in the world. So sunflower oil prices are at the level that the last time had been seen 13 years ago in 2008. Uh, due to some export restriction in Russia, the demand for wheat is growing as well, and the prices are close to record, although they are not as high as corn, but still Ukraine is one of the biggest producers. You know, wheat is an important uh, export product for, for Ukraine. And farlani barley, which seems to be like a niche product, but there is a huge demand in China, and Ukraine is one of the top exporters in the world. So opportunities are there. You obviously need to be able to ship it, need to be able to transport it, need to be able to to cope with logistics. Um, and you need to be able as well to ensure the position of a reliable business, a reliable supplier to the market, which um, I think if you want to look for something negative, something that we should remind that the last season was extremely difficult in the Ukrainian market, where we have seen plenty of Ukrainian suppliers that were simply uh, not delivering on the side contract. This is a, a a level of integrity that is expected if you want to be a reliable supplier in the world. Moving slowly to logistics. So um, I think Oleg has underlined a few, few major things. So starting with trucks, I think uh, you will never eliminate trucks from the grain industry. There will be always some areas uh, that will deliver grains by truck. Uh, you know, we all know there are issues. We all know there are overloaded trucks that are destroying the low quality roads. There is this big plan uh, by the government uh, to improve the roads, but I think it is probably much more for the other type of transportation than for, uh, for shipping grains. I agree with Oleg that we should be focusing on, on shipping the, the grains inside Ukraine, predominantly by the river and by rail. Starting with the river, I think the whole industry welcomed the uh, recent change in the legislation that allows foreign participants uh, to, 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 to compete in the Dnepro River uh, in grain supplies. And I think this is a change that we hope will increase competitiveness and reduce costs for the exporters, which means will increase the revenues of the farmers, because eventually uh, lower cost of shipping means higher price on the farm basis. Um, Rail, the same, we've seen a lot of changes in Ubzeleznica. There is still plenty to be done. I don't want to go into details, but, uh, you know, the fact that we still pay relatively higher prices exporting grains than some other product like iron, iron ore is not correct. And I think these are things that need to be managed. We have seen too many changes in the uh, leadership of Ubzeleznica, and despite some positive uh, uh, trends that we see, there are still plenty of, of to be done. Uh, I think it was Oleg who mentioned locomotives. I fully agree, you know, the liberalization of the 
locomotive market will improve the will improve the, the 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 reliability of Ukrainian railway. I like to remind that from the point of view of coverage of the country with the rail track, I think Ukraine is one of the leaders in Europe. We have plenty of roads. They just need to be or plenty of trucks. They just need to be properly used. Uh, there was a lot of investment by private entrepreneurs to to the rail cars. So whatever the government have not done or whatever Yugoslavia did, did not do, I think many of companies have done. This has been very welcome. But we need to have environment that allows of, uh, allows all of us a more free access so that we are sure that this investment makes sense and they pay off. Uh, finally, on the logistical side, what I would like to add that is important for us and for the old exporters is the port fees. Uh, Ukraine, for a number of reasons, is um, one of the most expensive countries uh, when it comes to the port fees uh, for uh, shipping its grains or other products. Uh, this has been improved in 2018, but we still very expensive. And uh, in order to continue boosting the production, to get this 120 million, I mean, we will not get to 120 million if we will not continue supporting the the farm industry and, you know, low in logistical costs generally, eventually goes back to the pocket of the farmer because they get a higher expand prices and they continue increasing their production. So opportunities are well there with us. Bunga has been successful for 20 years and we are happy to be here. Uh, we think the more foreign companies comes, the better the environment will be. I encourage everyone to do that. And... Uh, I support uh, any initiatives that improve logistics in relation to agriculture, but not only to any export opportunities that Ukraine has. Thank you. Thank you very much. So let's move on to one of the largest agricultural complexes in Ukraine. That's Nebulon. Uh, they do everything and they're huge. And they've been a leader in uh, building barges. They've been a leader in trying to promote river transportation in building port facilities in processing plants. Uh, it's really amazing. Uh, it's all done by, uh, started by a man in Ukraine who had vision about Ukraine helping feed itself and feed the world. We have today uh, Mikhailo Rizak from uh, Nebulin with us. Give us a quick overview of how large and what Nebulin does, uh, Mikhailo, and how important they are to uh, moving the Ukraine food system forward. It's all yours. Thank you, Morgan, and other speakers. Very pleasure to uh, represent the Nibulon. Nibulon is uh, really a leader in the domestic grain market and one of the largest uh, agri agriculture producers. We have uh, more than uh, 50 uh, production branches, culture than the uh, than 80,000 hectares land. Uh, agro land in uh, 12 regions of uh, Ukraine. We also is the leader of the investment in uh, inland waterway transport. We invest more than uh, 2.3 billion dollars uh, in this uh, economic sphere. And uh, also we uh, one of the leader of the export of uh, grain market. Uh, we export in uh, mar this marketing here more than uh, uh, 4.9 million tons uh, uh, agro uh, grain. Uh, in this year, we celebrate uh, our thir 30th uh, uh, years in December. And uh, we can say that uh, from uh, 2003, when we uh, load the first uh, vessel to the export to the Saudi Arabia. It's, well, it was a uh, pioneer. For this moment, uh, uh, in less than 20 years, uh, Nibelon has loaded more than 2,300 uh, uh, vessels to the exports. And uh, Nibelon has management uh, uh, and export to 75 uh, countries in the uh, world from Japan to Mexico. In uh, uh, for this moment, uh, we have twelve uh, uh, river uh, branches in the river Dnipro and uh, Bug. In uh, uh, inland water transport, uh, we uh, 
uh, with uh, our fleet uh, 85 uh, we have 85 vessels we uh, transport more than uh, 4 and point, uh, uh, 14 million tons cargos uh, 3.8 is in a Dnipro and another is uh, in the book uh, uh, we think that uh, in the next year we uh, can uh, have 4.5 million tons in the river transport and uh, every, every year we, we can do more and more. The biggest problem for this moment what we uh, still have in the inland water by transport is uh, ignore uh, European Union Directive 2003-96. Uh, it's about the uh, taxes uh, for uh, oil uh, because in Europe we know that the axis uh, of oil is uh, destroyed for the cabotage and in Ukraine we still uh, pay for the axis. It's a discrimination for the cargo, uh, for the cabotage and uh, in unequal economic conditions, uh, uh, cabotage and uh, international uh, races when you do. Also, uh, we know that the, uh, in 3rd uh, December last year, uh, we have the law about the navigation uh, in inland waterway transport, but uh, it's also ignore the regulations of uh, European Union uh, 3921 and uh, 3577. It's about the uh, navigation in the national flag and uh, uh, to have uh, uh, national flag in cabotage or uh, in the international uh, positions. So uh, we can say that the Ministry of Infrastructure for this moment is uh, more than five uh, months uh, of 21st year uh, do, uh, nothing to do to the uh, implement the, this uh, dra uh, this law to the uh, un under law system. It's a big problem for the uh, development of the inter water -water transport. Uh, I think it's. I can ask if you have some asks uh, questions. I can. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on now to a company that uh, produces crops. They have uh, uh, a huge herd of uh, dairy animals, and they actually take uh, the milk and process it into a consumer good, uh, which is evaporated milk, which they uh, supply in Ukraine, but also uh, in many other countries. That's a very family-run operation. It's very successful. So they go directly from the from the farm to the consumer uh, with a highly integrated process. Uh, Sergei, tell us about the Provio group of companies and what you do and what you add to the Ukraine uh, food supply uh, with, your, uh, with your milk products that you uh, uh, process and uh, can and export. It's all yours, Sergei. Thank you, Morgan. <clears throat> Thank you, Morgan. Uh, Thank you everybody for their words. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet with everybody. Uh, so let's in, let me introduce uh, myself. My name is Serhi. I'm a deputy CEO at the private joint stock company, Ishnya Condensed Milk Company, which is a part of a uh, uh, group of companies, Pravio. We, our main business is a dairy, uh, dairy plant. We produce uh, Sweden condensed milk as our main product and uh, evaporated milk. Our other business is agricultural business. Uh, it's not as big as Bangi or Nibelon. We have only 4,000 uh, 4, uh, hectares of uh, crops. But let me speak about more about dairy and uh, our final product, sweetened condensed milk. So um, the Ichnia Condensed Milk Company is uh, powerful modern enterprise that supply its product to more than 70 countries around the world. 
The company uh, began its history since 2006, and the production line consists of equipment from top global companies such as GIA, AMCO, Mega, Reda, and so on. Throughout the history, we receive a lot of uh, different awards in national and international exhibitions. We receive a halal certificate. We have the European certificates. We are able to export to U European Union. Uh, we have China and uh, a lot of different countries. And we are working on uh, different countries to receive uh, permission to export there. In terms of our uh, volumes, uh, we have uh, from around 1,500 to 2,000 metric ton of ready product Sweden condensed milk and evaporated per month. And this is around 70% of our volume we produce monthly. Uh, so our largest consumer are the United States of America, CIS countries such as Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and so on. We have African continent, um, we have uh, Latin America, um, and we are also heading to the China right now. We, it's in process. European Union is also our largest, one of the largest uh, consumer. And so if we're talking about the export, which is the topic of our today's meeting, uh, I would like to speak about of course, there is a lot of problem in terms of dairy dairy uh, production in Ukraine, as uh, this sector is uh, unregulated in terms of government, and we have a problem with uh, high prices for milk today, which is high. It's which is uh, very. Uh, it is hard to compete in the international market compared to the other countries such as New Zealand or European Union. But as because we have a modern facility, it gives us such opportunity to compete. And uh, I hope uh, in the in the next uh, couple of years we will uh, uh, we will cover this problem. But what what about the export? Of course, there was uh, already mentioned about the logistic problem, uh, especially after the COVID situation. We see how the logistic prices are going up for around maybe 50 to 100 percent compared to the previous years which is uh, of course uh, lays on the consumer it is hard them to understand why the prices is going high these times of course the milk prices is rising and uh, all the components so it it uh, creates some problem to the connection with the consumer and uh, with the uh, trading companies. Uh, if we're talking about in Ukraine, um, we have one of the big issues is uh, c connected with the state service of Ukraine on food safety and consumer protection. So uh, they are a very uh, regulated uh, authority, uh, which uh, we, which is hard to receive the permission to export to this or the other to the other country. So uh, in terms of if you want to export, you have to stay along lines. You have to have a lot of patience and to work hard to receive something from them to be able to export to United States or Japan or whatever country you want. And uh, of course, uh, if you are want to be a good exporter, you have to know all the taxes, quotation and income duties to the country you want to sell because sometimes there could be some high income duties which are not expected and it may be not a good surprise for you in the end when you when your customer will receive the uh, the end product at uh, the destination so uh, for today um, for this moment probably this um, i'm done if you have any question i can uh, answer it easily thank you so much well thank you very much I remember a few years ago, you guys had a huge crop. Uh, you needed to move it to market and you couldn't get uh, rail cars from UC. There was a huge shortage of rail cars. You couldn't get them. Your contracts ran out and it cost your company as a family held company, a lot of money. So one of them, one of the areas is most uh, causing increases in costs and costs that are out of line with other countries. Uh, 
is uh, Ukraine's railroad system. But let's go back to Leonid. Leonid, one of the underutilized uh, infrastructures in Ukraine is the rivers. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be done in the rivers to open them up, to dredge them, uh, uh, to use rivers much more effectively. Landed from your perspective, what should the government of Ukraine be do to improve the river transportation for food? Okay, Morgan, what we can do? I don't know whether you know, uh, there is a little bit to the south of Kansas. There is not just uh, to the south, uh, even uh, from uh, northern part uh, and downstairs, crossing uh, St. Louis, uh, Mississippi River. I don't know whether you had an opportunity to move through the river. I did it several times, and not just uh, through Mississippi. If you go to the north, uh, uh, south uh, to Texas, in Texas, it's not such a big river, but there are three rivers. I would check whether you know United States or no, uh, could you uh, tell me the name of those rivers? Morgan. Well, there's the Missouri River. Uh, yeah. It's a big one that flows into the Mississippi. And of course, the Mississippi is the main one that carries. Oh. Uh, okay, good. Enough, 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 enough. You know, but I don't know whether you travel as me did along those rivers. So uh, we need the same infrastructure. Of course, uh, number one uh, issue is the financing. Uh, number two is uh, the uh, knowledge experience. We, we have enough, but not as much as United States. Uh, uh, then we need uh, the capacity, industrial capacity plants to construct the modern uh, facilities to move through the rivers. We have it, Nibelong, uh, doing a lot, and uh, this company must not just uh, construct for itself, you must sell more to uh, Cargill, to ADM, to another companies, uh, to let them use this kind of facilities and to be as much powerful as uh, American um, uh, companies uh, which are doing the same. So we know what to do. What we need, we need just the money. Uh, maybe something else what, what belong to the uh, state authorities, because there are people now, unfortunately, they don't have the experience. That's why maybe I will take somebody with myself and we will go to, to move along the Mississippi and they must look around and watch how it looks like. Maybe like this, maybe it's not necessary. Please, Morgan, take care of those who can help us and we can do this together with American companies and we must develop this infrastructure. Rivers, it's a huge instrument uh, to make our logistic system powerful and competitive with European one. And it would help us a lot to increase the uh, export potential of Ukraine. Lena, thank you very much. It's really, uh... And it's a huge food system and its ability to feed itself in the world. And one of the main things is they don't have to use a, a, to a very high percentage of their food for themselves. So it gives a huge export potential. And it's kind of sad that the cost of moving all this food and the infrastructure uh, costs companies more than it does in most other countries because of the lack of investment, uh, particularly by the government in uh, infrastructure. Uh, Oleg Samos, uh, tell us about the major problem with the railroads. What do the, does you see? Do they have a monopoly and they control the monopoly. They're a huge monopoly. They're a bloated uh, monopoly. Uh, Oleg, what's, uh, tell us three things that you see needs to do and what should the government do to, to force UZ to be a better mover of, of products for you, for companies and for Ukraine? It's definitely because of the monopolistic status and without the lack of the investment into the system, the railroad is not operating efficiently in Ukraine. And definitely there should be then monopolization and non-discrimination. Like the Ukrainian railroad like should be gone through the restructuring because what is currently the status that the uh, 
logistic of the agricultural product is subsidizing the passengers and is subsidizing transfer of the other products like non-agriculture and it's not fair like basically the passengers uh, logistics is ba uh, should be uh, should borne by the state budget or by other means, not at the account of the companies. Uh, what is also needs to be done is to focus on the connection in the ports, because we see there is a very big bottleneck in the ports, and uh, the station are not able to efficiently process the goods. Uh, then there is a need to decrease the time for the turnover of the wagons. And basically that is a strategy because now it's from But normally it should be three days. And of course the fair, fair and predictable tariffs because the cargo owners, they should, the freight forwarders, they should know in advance uh, basically how to transfer at what cost to transfer and to have the stable uh, logistic cost. And of course, the private locomotive. Andrzej was already saying, if Ukrainian railroad company is not able to make significant investment into the locomotives, like let the private investors buy locomotives and then the professional operators to operate them and have the government control the safety and uh, dispatching systems. And I would I want to also to add a couple of the points, what is important for the investment and not only into the railroad or into the river or into the agriculture. Like recently in Ukraine, there was passed the so-called the nanny law, like all the support to the investments, which provides a special opportunities for the companies which invest in more than $20 million in order to get exempt from the VAT and to get exempt from the corporate income tax. And this could be a very good opportunity for the investors in order to use this mechanism. And another issue I would like to say about the agriculture and the opportunities is the land reform. We are at the historic time today uh, because in June, starting from the 1st of July, uh, the Ukrainian agricultural land can be sold now only between the Ukrainians and only up to 100 hectares. From 2024, it can be sold like up to 10,000 hectares and only also to the Ukrainian entities and to the individuals. But it will definitely affect the land market. It could put the liquidity uh, and it could provide the banking finance. And another form which is also important for the infrastructure is irrigation. Uh, because currently in Ukraine, only 5,000 hectares 500,000 hectares are under the irrigation. In the Soviet times, it was 2 million. And we definitely need to move the opportunities and to pass the law in order to unblock the irrigation reform, which will definitely increase the crops and which definitely focus the production, not only into the grain and oil seeds, but also into the niche uh, products like vegetables, like berries, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oleg. It's uh, been very obvious for years and years and years when we have meetings with the president of Ukraine or other high officials, and you ask agri business, agricultural companies, what's their number one problem in Ukraine? They say UZ, the railroad monopoly. What's your number two problem? It's UZ, the railroad monopoly. I think they have two or 300,000 employees. And like you said, they say they have to make money off their commercial business so they can subsidize passengers. In every country in the world that I know, passenger transportation on a railroad is subsidized by the government. It needs to be a separate entity in Ukraine and it needs to be taken care of by the government for passengers, not by grain companies and not by people who buy food. And then they ask them the number three problem in Ukraine. They say UZ, the railroad system is outdated. It's slow, it's expensive. They don't have enough cars. 50, 60% of their cars are, should be scrapped. But the government of Ukraine does very little to improve the management and to improve UZ. So it's still a huge problem. Thank you for mentioning land reform. We'll get back to that and also irrigation. Let's go to Andre. Andre, you guys specialize uh, in not just uh, you know raw crops and raw products, but you specialize in adding value. Tell us the brand name of your oil 
and uh, tell us a little more about your value added operations, how you're adding value to sunflowers and seeds, not just exporting raw oil. Uh, tell us about your, uh, th that part of your company and what your plans are for the future to increase value added products. Uh, okay, I, I'll try. Although I'd like to make a comment, uh, just one comment to what we said before. Uh, if you think about uh, all these problems we have, UZ and uh, I don't want to name VAT issues years back, uh, I, I'd like to say Ukraine has managed to solve a lot of issues. We're still far away before we reach the final target. But uh, over these 30 years, and I cannot say I've been with Ukraine over 30 years, although, you know, for 15 years, for sure, I've been very close. And even before in my, when I was really like a junior merchant, I was for a period of time in charge of uh, Ukrainian uh, trade flows. I, I still would say it's a huge progress that has been made in relation to agriculture. Maybe not every sector is the same, but in case of agribusiness, plenty of things have been done. Now, uh, coming back to your questions, uh, uh, I mentioned uh, in the beginning, we are uh, uh, the owner of probably the number one brand in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. It's called Oleina, although I don't think that it's my role here to market our products, but it's a very good oil. Um, uh, we have been having plenty of... Uh, uh, issues always, uh, you know, like in a, I mean, just give you the example of the last year, it's actually current season when we, as I mentioned before, when we achieved record prices uh, for oil in the world, uh, you know, we are, uh, uh, of course, for the industry, it's good. Uh, for the farmers, it's good. For the consumer, it's not so good uh, because the prices of oleina in the retail have increased probably by 60-70% over the last 12 months. Not only our oil, the same with the competition oil. And obviously that brings a lot of concern from the government. And, uh, you know, this is very typical in a country with a relatively low average level of income. The protecting consumer of the consumer is an important thing. In the same time, some of the attempts uh, that are made by the government are, can be in the longer term uh, dangerous for the for the industry because uh, the discussion about uh, export bans, uh, export restriction. I mean, I think we are sh should advocate for the free market, and the free market will allow the the prices to stabilize. When they go up, they usually well go down. So um, uh, Oleina has been a leading brand in Ukraine, but I'd like to to underline that Ukraine is just not exporting uh, raw products. We're not exporting wheat, barley oil and soybeans. We also exporting uh, uh, products that are coming from these grains. I mean, uh, we as Bunge have been, uh, you mentioned export to the US. We have been shipping the Ukrainian refined high oleic sun oil uh, to the US last year. Uh, we are exporting the processed goods, uh, whether bottled oil or different refined oil blends from Ukraine to five different continents from our plant in Dnipro. So uh, Ukraine is moving on this value-added um, value added products. I mentioned uh, that, you know, our long-term partner, uh, Spanish company DAXA, have um, joined us and we have opened uh, recently a plant in the location called Trostyanets, where Bunga used to have a silo, where they are going to produce corn grids that will be exported into the countries in Middle East, in Africa, and uh, maybe even into the Far East. So there are plenty of opportunities for the value-added products. Uh, again, I think Ukraine with its vast opportunities, um, I kind of share this view that we can cross 100 million tons mark for grain production plus uh, 30 million of production of oil seeds. This is in the cards. Uh, it does not have to be exported as raw products, and it will be um, it will be uh, uh, an opportunity for Ukraine to start developing the value-added product. And before I, I, I leave, I wanted to add one thing because I just would like to to underline one element that I didn't mention, but this is important, especially for the for the listeners from from basically United States. Uh, and for the, any potential investor who is thinking about coming to Ukraine, 
you know, uh, in our industry, we'll always have a huge support of the US, US government and the US embassy in Kiev. And whether I was with Bunge or with another company, this support was something that allowed us to navigate in sometimes difficult environment. It's been improved over, over these 30 years, but you know, it's never been very easy, especially in the early years. So uh, just, just if you have any doubts, you have people like Morgan, but you also have the US government who will support you. I mean, I encourage everyone to look at this country because the opportunities in agriculture and logistics are very, very high. Did I, I reply your question, uh, uh, Morgan? I'm sorry, what? Yes? Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, Thank you very uh, much. We, we appreciate uh, Bungie being one of the leaders in adding value to products and not just, uh, that's why we talked about moving from bread basket to market basket. We didn't want to just export more wheat uh, to, uh, to Europe. We want, Ukraine can be a market basket of a whole wide variety of high value products. Uh, and that's what the future is. I, I kind of think uh, Ukraine being the breadbasket, that's about a hundred year old slogan. Uh, that's not the slogan for uh, today. Ukraine, Ukraine is a market basket of high value foods for itself and for the world. Mikhailo, uh, you, Nebulon's been a leader in river, uh, working on the river. How many river port, river uh, grain elevators have you built? How many grain elevators have you built on the river? We have uh, 12 uh, elevators in the river, uh, 10 of these uh, in the river Dnipro and two in the Yuzhny uh, Buch. Uh, and uh, one we have the, in the Nikolaev the, for the uh, sea, uh, sea, sea elevator. Uh, uh, what I um, want to say also that uh, in Ukraine, one of the biggest problem uh, of uh, development uh, in land water transport is uh, that uh, in the world, water transport is the uh, cheapest uh, transport. Uh, but uh, in Ukraine, we have the uh, structure of the cost of the transport when the water transport is more expensive than the railway or and uh, sometimes uh, as uh, a road transport. So, um, what we have the problems in in the inland water with transport because uh, uh, so we still ignore uh, exper um, experience of the European Union. We still uh, pay pay for the locks. We still uh, pay for the bridges. We still uh, cannot go uh, with uh, one tax and two barges barges. Uh, to the lock for uh, for the one uh, one going, we still must uh, go only one tag and uh, one barges to the one lock. Uh, we don't understand why, because uh, more than thirty years ago, uh, in the Dnipro we go uh, and other companies go with one tag and two barges uh, to the uh, to the lock. Uh, we uh, as a company uh, then the. For 10 years, uh, Nibulon has uh, transported by Ukrainian in, in inland waterway transport more than 20, uh, 20 million tons of cargoes. Uh, so, so we understand this problem uh, uh, and uh, still uh, try to, uh, to, uh, to say to the other companies to uh, development on also in the water with transport and uh, take the remove the uh, road transport from the our highways so that is uh, in a bad very bad conditions well thank you very much uh, let's now turn to the uh, final comments from all of our panelists about uh, moving food from producer to consumer everybody says that the world's not going to be able to feed its population in 2050 without uh, Ukraine doubling again its uh, food production and its food exports. We don't like embargoes. We don't like uh, high costs. We think the government of Ukraine should focus more on what the food system needs because, as you say, it's the largest exporter. 
it's a huge uh, uh, value added to the to the people of Ukraine. It's the most important asset that they have. We've got to get land privatization. We've got to get more irrigation. We've got to dredge the rivers. So much that needs to be done. So let's turn first to Sergei. Your final comments, and then we'll go through the panel. Thank you, Sergei, and thank you for exporting all those high value milk products from Ukraine. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah, um, as a final comment, I would I would like to finalize with uh, some positive words. So uh, I appreciate the words from Andrei Rozinski that uh, there is a, a lot of opportunities in the world for Ukrainian companies, for Ukrainian exporters. We just need to find uh, where to go. We need just to be sure that everything will be fine. And uh, there is a, lot, a big and a huge, we don't even know how much it, it, it is huge market for grain, for milk, for all agricultural products. In terms of milk, there is uh, our company is the biggest exporter, but we see our share in the world, uh, maybe even less than 1% which means that uh, the market of just sweet and condensed milk is very huge. So you can put your money in uh, whatever sector and uh, find your market where to sell and you'll be in a high profit and you'll be successful. What we need just is uh, support of the government and I hope they will find our words and they will make sense for them. So, and I hope everything will be fine. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, panelists. Of your of your condensed milk products, what percent are sold domestically and what percent are sold internationally? Seventy percent of our products we sell international. Mostly, it's a private label for uh, traders or uh, private companies, and uh, like fifty percent is private. Fifty is our own brands, Ichna and Milada. And uh, in Ukraine, we sell thirty percent of our uh, production. And in Ukraine, we have share of maybe. And you think your you think the opportunity for, for doubling your exports is real, right? Yeah, sure. You're not even double. In okay. in, uh, in in Malaysia, we uh, I know there is like one. There is six factories uh, which produce sweet and condensed milk, and just one factory is six times bigger than our. So you can calculate how much the market is. Okay, Oleg, your final comments. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, I would say that the state needs still to do a lot of things in order to attract more and more investment. But the progress is already laid on. And in terms of what's need to be done, it's of course the opening new markets. And the government should work in order to sign more free trade agreements with other countries. And it should sign with other countries the sanitary and phytosanitary protocols in order to allow uh, the food products to go inside the other countries. Uh, then the fair rules, uh, whether it refers to the tariffs on the railroad or the river transportation. So the fair rules and the fair tariffs. And the tariffs Ukraine should make uh, also competitive and not as higher as in other countries. Uh, in terms of the progress, in terms where the where the investment should be done, it's of course the railroad. It's of course the building new for grain terminals. We see already the huge increase in the number of the grain transshipment facilities. But still, like there are a lot of opportunities in order to build the new grain terminals in the river transportation, like building more barges, building more river elevators. And of course, the reconstruction on the uh, on the um, on the roads, like whether the government is already investing heavily, and launching the presidential campaign called the big construction. So all these measures will definitely help in order to accommodate the increase of the agricultural production in Ukraine, and finally move the products and the processed products into the final consumers domestically and internationally. Okay, and Andre, thank you for all your final comments you made about uh, Bungie doing value added products. We know there's a lot of potential there and uh, you guys are a leader in that, that area. One final comment from you. 
Well, I, uh, I'd like to repeat what I said. In a way, I made the conclusion. I kind of made my conclusions already. I, I think there's plenty to be done. You know, the things like red tape, it's still not fully eliminated. And this is something that for Ukraine was always a big issue. Um, all the comments about uh, Uzi agree, you know, the railway needs to be fixed. Uh, uh, the uh, legislative uh, uh, mess and lack of stability in legislation is also something that could be coped with. But having said all this, uh, um, as I said in the beginning, Ukraine has grown from being a uh, net importer of grains to become one of the key uh, biggest exporters of grain in the world, and it's not over yet. So, um, I mean, Sergei is an excellent example of uh, what can you achieve uh, in Ukraine in farming. Um, uh, Nibulon is a great example what a local company can achieve in uh, grain export, building their own uh, infrastructure with the support of international financial institutions like EBRD. So, you know, whoever is looking for an opportunity in Ukraine, I think the opportunity is there. And uh, uh, the more foreign investors we have, the more pressure we can put on the government, on the authorities, with the support of uh, US government er, uh, and, the other, and the EU uh, governments uh, or EU uh, commission uh, uh, to eliminate the weaknesses and to uh, continue helping Ukraine to become the agricultural powerhouse. I believe okay. it's going to happen. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, Mikhailo, one comment from you, one short comment. Full speed ahead for Nebulon. Um, I think that uh, our government must do what they uh, uh, introduce to the people this uh, about the deregulation. We know the government orders about the deregulation, about the locks, about the bridges, that, that uh, it, it must be uh, more cheaper. And uh, we also know that Yes, we we also think think that we must implement uh, the uh, regulations and directive and uh, experience uh, of uh, European Union of the regulation uh, in the water well transport. One of the uh, priorities is uh, that inland water well transport. Uh, 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 don't uh, don't pay the access uh, on the fuel is the is the first priority to the implement in Ukraine and when we have the uh, economic conditions with another company and we uh, I think that in the short term uh, can can uh, look uh, the companies like Nibulon like near near 10 companies like Nibulon thank you thank you very much uh, Mr. Agribenis Mr. Kozacheko we have one minute left for you to close. Your final comment, keep it short. <laughs> Leonard. You're muted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much. Again. Well, one minute, Leonard. Close okay. up quickly. Okay. Morgan, uh, next time we need more of, uh, participants at the uh, conversation uh, because we've been discussing very important uh, issue uh, and topic uh, which should be utilized in concrete investment projects. So please do your best to help us to proceed such a way. And thank you very much for that. Well, thank you for all the panelists. Uh, the number one subject in Ukraine is economic growth. The number one driver is agriculture. Thank you very much. And now back to you, Nadia. Yes, Morgan, thank you so very much. This has been an incredibly informative uh, session, but also I think uh, setting up challenges uh, for those of us who are interested in helping Ukraine. I uh, just want to announce that uh, Congressman uh, Woman uh, Marcy Capture will be appearing uh, today at the end of the program at 2.40. And there is nobody in the US government that is a bigger uh, champion of Ukraine's agriculture sector than Marcy Capter. Uh, I would just also, uh, you know, we're having a two and a half days focusing on the economic uh, sectors of Ukraine, and uh, Morgan knows uh, we're not we're not just uh, 
NGO, we're a do tank. And so we are at this moment preparing recommendations for what kind of technical assistance should be given by our government, Congress and administration. Morgan is a member of our economic security task force. And we are, it, we are trying to build up that uh, task force to get a more specific recommendations. And so I look forward to working with Morgan and all of you uh, for input into that uh, task force. So thank you, Morgan, again. We started from the uh, bread basket to the market basket, and I'm thrilled to see uh, again. And uh, this is one more thing about agribusiness. Everybody talks about the IT sector and opportunities, but I think we need more uh, marketing, if you would say, about uh, agribusiness and the kind of growth it experiences, which is actually in some ways more important because of the uh, resources that you need to grow these businesses and the kind of infrastructure you have to build. So. Uh, Kudos to everybody who's been uh, staying with staying the course and best wishes to you all. Over to you, Morgan. Oh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. We look forward to continuing to work on the development of the agribusiness sector of Ukraine. And so from the U.S. Ukraine Business Council, full speed ahead. Goodbye. The next session is on biotech. So you're welcome to join in on that one. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.